Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 60 of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, and you know who's with me. Yep, and we're here, Mash, to review the first test between West Indies and England. For all the talk of both sides brittle batting, we sort of saw them meander along for five days, remarkably. And um, it's checkmate at the moment. We're at a stalemate looking ahead to the second test. But we've got a lot to talk about as t- in terms of what happened in the test match, Mash. Most definitely. And of course, we uh, in 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 partnership with the cricketer um, over the next few weeks of this uh, West Indies England test series. We've got the great George DeBell with us again. Those of you watching on the visuals, you're probably looking at his background going, where is he? He he has literally landed in Barbados and come straight to do this podcast recording. What a guy. (laughs) No, no rest for the wicked indeed. George, how you doing? Well, I, you know, I'm all the better for arriving here. I should tell people that the Airbnb I was meant to be in cancelled on me at absolutely the last minute. And I've been phoning around and um, a friend owns this hotel and I've got a room in this. They've given me a suite for tonight. So I don't know where the hell I was going to stay. I was going to be on the beach. Um, anyway, so I've kind of landed on my feet. So, I'm, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to talk to you and a pleasure to be here. If, if you're listening to this on the audio or even watching on the visuals, the sound of waves crashing in the background isn't us doing an audio effect. <laughs> George is literally next to the scene <laughs> as we're recording this. <laughs> as we're recording it's, this. it's quite the scene. <laughs> yeah. But, um, too noisy. Do you want me to move? No, no, no. This is perfect. <laughs> okay. but, but, George, you know what? Let, let, let's get right into it. I mean, as Santoki kind of yeah. said at the top of the show, it, it, it's checkmate. Um, at this particular moment in time, or stalemate, we should say. Neither side has taken an advantage um, from Antigua. Um, I I mean, we've kind of said as a Caribbean cricket podcast that if there were any England fans who didn't rate us as a side, maybe there was a performance there from the West Indies that would mean, OK, this is likely to be a, a very even um, series. But before we kind of chop that up and get into the into the the positives and negatives etc the the big talking point out of the out of the test match george was was the track now obviously you were there you posted a picture um on i think the day before the test and i we commented on it and said this looks like it's going to be a road and i'm just in i'm just intrigued to know if that's what your initial impressions were before the test match started did it pan out what you expected based on on the on the track you saw prior to the test match starting Good question, uh, because uh, it actually screamed to me that it would um, turn and, and, and even break up because it looks a bit crusty on the surface. But I've been here before, and you know I have friends in Antigua, and they all said, "No, nah, this is going to die. This is going to be like a flanker wicket." And uh, and they were absolutely right. It didn't really deteriorate. It just got lower and lower. And well, it could hardly get slower, could it? It, it, it? it was it was a poor wicket, and it's certainly not the wicket that they were asked to choose. And uh, I, I don't know what Tony Merrick's doing, really. If it, you know, the former fast bowler that he was would have hated that surface. It wasn't really good for anyone, was it? And actually, I thought both teams did really well to get anywhere near producing. I know it was slow, but I actually quite enjoyed it. It was compelling in a gentle, slow way, I thought. And both teams battled really hard. So, I, um, you know, I applaud them for that. But, yeah, it was a poor wicket. And uh, while we are on it, the umpire wasn't very good either. <laughs> that doggy go on. Jump in, that doggy go <laughs> Yeah, the, the umpire in Joe Wilson, obviously, um, we've known him in the past to, to make questionable decisions. And he lived up to his reputation in this test, Mash. Yeah. Um, listen, I don't want to be that guy. As much as we joke about it. On, on our on our social handles, I re- actually don't want to be that guy who kind of um, draws out an umpire's name and says it's not good enough. But he is supposed to be an elite umpire. 
He's he's on the elite panel, and I'm sorry, but if we're gonna call a spade a spade, he's not very good. Or is or is that harsh, George? He's certainly had a poor game, and I would say that it's not his first poor game. But I, I, to be fair, it was all three of them. I mean, mm. he's literally got the TV umpire pressing the wrong button. <laughs> he's literally got him pressing out when it's not out. Uh, but I mean, it's really basic stuff. Uh, there was a, a moment, I think it was only yesterday, when they were the two umpires were conferring, and they looked really confused. I genuinely thought they might award a free kick. <laughs> but um, I mean, that, uh, what, one of the weird things about pandemic cricket is as we're slowly getting back to normal, that's the one thing that hasn't changed. As in, we've why, kept. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, well I'm here. I mean, you... Sorry, gone. Well, I'm here. I mean, I've <laughs> travel, and thousands of other people travel no doubt enjoying my apartment up the road just now. So, uh, as in the one I have booked. Um, so, I don't really see why the ICC can't move people around as well. I mean, I, I suspect they've saved £2,000, haven't they? Well, I mean, it's, it's the only possible reason um, I could look at, but I, I do think we've got to get... Not, I'm not saying that would suddenly make the umpires better, but I do think Joel and Gregory could do with being out of the firing line and being somewhere else, I don't know, go and go and umpire Pakistan versus Australia or, or whatever it might be and just kind of be away from the, the, the eagle eye, so to speak. Um, but, you know, looking at the, I mean, the, the pitch notwithstanding, the umpires notwithstanding, and I guess, George, you've kind of alluded to that it kind of, I wouldn't call it thrilling, but it was an intriguing, an intriguing test match in and of it, in and of itself. Obviously, we spoke before um, the test match about the, the, the Red Bull reset. So what's your assessment of the reset after this first test? Can Is there even an assessment to make? Yeah, I, I thought there were gentle signs of progress. Look, let's remember that we're talking about two modest signs. And so we shouldn't exaggerate um, any signs of progress there are. You know, it doesn't mean they're about to go and beat Australia in Australia or India in India. Neither of these signs are about to do that. But um, I did see some signs of improvement, actually, from both sides. I mean, do you want me to talk about England in particular? But yeah, go for well, England first. Well, there were two or three things that were interesting. Uh, at, just for the toss, Johnny Bairstow presented Alex Lees with his cap. Now, Johnny Bairstow played 80 on test. He's actually got the longest test career of anyone on the side. But I don't think I've ever heard him referred to as a senior player before. So I thought that was interesting. At the same time, uh, Jack Leach was uh, asked to make a speech in the dressing room ahead of play, and I believe Zach Crawley was too. So you've got these three players who, you know, they're probably seen as important for the future, but they haven't been big figures in that dressing room before, and they were given more responsibility. They embraced it, and actually they, they did really well. I think it didn't work with everyone. I think Chris Wokes, for example, had a modest game, but those three guys had really good games in different ways. Two of them obviously got centuries. Jack Leach, you know, in, in, a more, in a less obvious way, I thought had a terrific game. And he certainly was the only England bowler probably that outbowled his uh, counterpart on the other side. Um, I thought that they stood up when given that responsibility. Now, could they have been given that if James Anderson and Stuart Broad were there? Well, I would say yes, they could, to be honest. But I know lots of people would say, well, maybe they couldn't. Maybe they would have felt overshadowed. Maybe... You know, there were always bigger figures in the, in the room. I don't, I don't know about that. But, you know, once they make the argument that they're going to do this, you want them to make it work and show some consistency. And I, and I did see some, some cautious steps in the right direction from them. And, and also, um, you know, they battled. They were four down in the first hour on the first day. Mm. Uh, and they were behind on uh, first inning. And actually, I thought that declaration, I don't think history will show, you know, if you look at the scoreboard, the scorebook in 100 years, doesn't look like it's particularly successful. But actually, it felt like the barrier between um, the draw and winning was a bit, um, a bit thinner than it might appear. You know, had Jason Holder been out LBW, mm. and of course they didn't review it, so they can't really blame the umpires. Um, then, I don't know, that, that game is still on, I reckon. So, 
I, I, I applauded that declaration. I, honestly, I'm a very boring man, you see. I, I, if I was being captain, I might have battled all day. I'd just try to grind those steamers down. Um, so, so I applaud them for, for putting that declaration in. You know, West Indies, as we know, we've seen them chase down 430 targets in the last few years, mostly a year ago. And, um, yeah, it was great. And it, and, and it, there, was, there was a half hour or so, an hour in the final day where you just thought it might work. So I thought they, they made the best of um, a difficult situation. And I thought, yeah, a little couple of steps in the right direction for England. Yeah, definitely. I think at 67 for four, it kind of felt like West Indies, there was potential for them to collapse and England might have pulled an unlikely victory off. But just on, on in terms of the, the negatives, I guess, for England, Mark Wood obviously l- looks unlikely he'll feature for the rest of the series. Just how big a blow is that for the side? Oh, it's massive, isn't it? Because it means that they've got a one pace attack and that one pace is sort of fast medium. Um, all right arm. Mark Wood is the quickest bowler in the series and might be the quickest test bowler in the world consistently that that suggests he is. Um, so it's a huge disappointment. Um, I can't believe he'll play the rest of the series. They haven't ruled him out yet properly, but why risk it? Someone like that, so precious. Um, so that's a, a real shame. The other thing was, you know, West Indies team was massive out building with the new ball. With the new ball. Uh, Timo Rose with the new ball. Terrific, wasn't it? Uh, they all were, actually. Um, uh, apart from, I, th- I thought Al J- Zari Joseph had a really good spell with the old ball in the second inning. Yep. Um, he showed terrific uh, sort of limited overs skill. Anyway, I, uh, so I thought at one stage or another, all four of the West Indian seamers did a pretty good job. And, um, you know, Chris Wokes and Craig Anderson looked... Um, a bit innocuous in the place, and they wasted a few balls in the pitch, and it was vital on that wicket. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting you mention Wilkes and Overton, because I do think there's some question marks there, particularly going into the, the second test. But even before we look at those question marks, now, I was under the impression, George, as I'm sure all of the English cricket media were and England fans, that, that Ben Stokes was going to be gradually <laughs> eased yeah. back into proceedings. Now, I was speaking to a fellow fan who's on their way to Barbados this morning and um, we were looking at the game and he said to me, Stokes bowled 41 overs, which was more than Jason Holder. And J- Now, the only reason I'm making that point is not the generic, oh, they're both all-rounders. That's not my point. Jason Holder is a frontline bowler for us, but Stokes bowled more overs than, than Jason Holder. And I know, I, I, I know Wood wasn't bowling and... Stokes had to kind of step in and Stokes is the kind of character who will say, give me the ball and mm. so on and so forth. But put yourself in Joel Root's shoes for a second, George, mm. knowing that Wood was out. Wouldn't it have made a bit more sense to probably bat on or alternatively not bowl Stokes as much? Or do you think they just had no option? In the first innings, I'm surprised to how little Joe Root bowled himself. And, and they keep saying, I don't know if you noticed this, but the England managers keep saying well, you can't get the ball out of Ben Stokes' hands. They've got to stop saying that. It makes them seem so weak. You know, <laughs> they're the captain coach. Just say no to him. Not, not that that's a criticism of him. I mean, what you see in there is a microcosm of what England are with Ben Stokes. They are massively reliant on him. He is this, you know, this huge talent with this massive character, and I thought he was fantastic. Uh, and. It wasn't just that Wood was injured, was it? It was that Wokes and Overton couldn't quite do it. And he thumped a, a, a length, bowling straight. I've never seen Wokes struggle with his line before, you know. I've been watching Wokes since he's 16 years old. And that's, I don't know what the matter with him was. Um, he's so much better than that. But anyway, Stokes stood up and took the responsibility on himself. But literally a few days ago, we were at Coolidge, at the end of that game, and we were asking about his bowling, he said, listen, feel okay, but everyone says to me about side strain, give it another seven to ten days. So I'm not really going to be bowling very much in the test because 41 over. I don't know. Uh, I, it, it would appear they've got away with it. But they've got to look after these guys. You know, Joffre's whole career has been jeopardised, I think, by over bowling. I don't think that's the case with Mark Wood or Ollie Stone. But some of these talents are so precious. So I think they got that wrong. 
Was I a bit surprised about the declaration? Yeah, I was. I was. I really was. But was it also kind of fun? Well, yeah, it, it, it was. So I, I think in general terms, I applaud it. I think he only bowled 10 overs, didn't he, in the second inning? Mm, 29. Mm. Uh, maybe nine, something like that. Uh, and, and it, you know, it was mainly up to Jack Leach. But, yeah, he keeps standing up. I, I, if you're really honest and you want the best bowling attack, you would probably, for uh, Barbados, you would probably give them folks a new ball, which I'm sure they won't. But, um, you know, Ollie Robinson and Ben Stokes might be the best new ball attack available to England right now. I, I'm full of admiration for Ben Stokes. And by the, other, so, the other thing was, in the Ashes, and, and even previously, uh, too often, He's been used as a sort of, well, not the enforcer, I hate that expression, but, and he's just pitched it short and tries to make things happen. He's so much better than that. Mm. So I like it when he picks it up and uses his skills, his swing, hits the speed, all those things. Uh, and I thought he did that, and he bowled like, uh, you know, the, 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 what I think he is, he's a very talented team bowler. Worthy just about of selection as a special bowler. He's a top all rounder. So... Before we kind of look at the West Indies point of view, I'm just very intrigued to know, I'm sure those listening will be intrigued to know, obviously Wood's out, so Robinson comes in. That That's kind of clear. Well, we Would you know that Robinson's okay, but yeah. Well, assuming, fine, okay, so. assuming Robinson's fine, <laughs> Robinson comes in. But would you drop one of Waltz or Overton for Mahmood? Well, the first thing you do is look at how they come through the, the game. Mm. Um, uh, and then... There is, whatever happens, a strong case for either refreshing the team, because those guys were on their feet a lot, or bringing in something different. Um, it might be that the keys was brought in, you know, the slightly different skills might be a little bit quicker, certainly a bit quicker than Craig over uh, So that is something that they, they, I think they probably will look at. I suspect they'll give Chris Wokes another game because of his um, career and the way he's thought of in English cricket generally. You know, he's had a four game, no way around it. But, you know, you're allowed to have four games. And uh, so the key could possibly come in ahead of Craig Overton, yeah, just freshen it up a little bit. Mm. So let's move on to West Indies now. If we, we start with the positives, I mean, someone we talked up a lot, me and Michelle in the last episode, Jaden Seals, um, as much as it was a tough wicket to bowl on, he took four wickets in the first innings. George, what did you make of seeing him up close and personal? Uh, it's, it's, 20. Uh, he's obviously a really exciting prospect. I was really impressed by him. He actually bounced a couple of people out, you know. I mean, he bounced out Chris White, didn't he? And there was another one. Um, so, I was uh, very impressed. There's a lot to like there. There's not matches to go wrong there. And uh, I'd love to be able to pitch off him a bit more, and I very much hope I do this week. It, it's one area that the Caribbean just seems to keep producing. You know, and there's so much more to come from him. If you think how much they Kumar Roach improved, I know he's lost a wee bit of pace over the years, but boy, is he skilled. And uh, there's no reason why Seals can add to the, the basic package he has. is very, very good. Uh, and I think he'll, he'll get better in the next few years. And as I say, 20. England is killed for a guy like that, yeah? Yeah, I, have, I, I, I mean, I have to agree then. I think the only thing we're worried about, there's only two things Santok and I are worried about. A, how we manage him. I mean, we've managed him well thus far, it must be said. But going forward, how we manage him. And B, as with all West Indian players, what happens when the white ball money starts to come and the T20 circuit, etc. That's the only thing that could get in Jaden Seal's way. But at the moment, certainly the sky... Um, the sky's the limit for this guy. But um, a, a, another player worth talking about, and <laughs> it'll, it'll be intrigued. In fact, I'm interested to know if you managed to speak to any West Indians who may have had this opinion. But um, believe it or not, George, there there are. In, I could find you enough West Indians who would have said that Inkrumah Bonner batted too slow um, in the first innings. <laughs> um, whereas our opinion is every I test side. Well, I, I, I love Bonner. Yeah, well, go for it. Go for it, George. <laughs> well, he's well, he's well, well, well. To get the first innings, he saved the game in the second innings. You know, so from, if you want to get the first innings. But in the first innings, he was gutsy as all hell. He took a few mm. blows to the body. Uh, uh, by the way, so did uh, Kiba Roach, was brave with the bat. Um, so I thought he was, I think Bonner's terrific. I mean, without Bonner in that middle order, 
I don't know, this, it, this is strong. And obviously it's over the top. But he's kind of doing the chamber pool job. Exactly. That's, it's just a big shoot to film. So without him, I don't know, he's probably not. I mean, it's that... I, I, I don't know. Do, 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 not quite sure. You don't want more people like Blackwood in that side, surely. I mean, there, there's a lot of fun to be had at Jermaine Blackwood. But his second inning shot was, you know, it, it, these, these things kind of define him a bit. And, and there are two or three like that, aren't there? You, you'd have to say John Campbell's similar. So I think there's absolutely room for Bonner. I thought he absolutely um, deserved his player of the match. It's such an incredible story. Just the fact that, you know, what was it, a year ago, just over a year ago, February 21, he made his test debut. He was 32, I reckon, then, and averaging, what, 28 in first-class cricket. So you just, I'm afraid, you think straight away, well, that's a sticking plastic solution. But after that, what's the average? 44 or something now. I think he's on 49 at the moment. Yeah. Is he? Well, that's terrific. And look, there is there are doubts because he's obviously doing it on very slow wickets. And he's able to use his determination and bravery and patience on a quicker wicket. He'll, he'll be tested in other ways. But I haven't seen him on a quicker wicket yet. And um, I like his character. And um, he gave West Indies a chance of winning that game. And then he saved it. So, if you're criticising him, I don't know. What do you want? Is, is, well, is, we, is, is, is we question. Go on, sorry, Santoli. I was going to say. So we 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 talked on the positive. There were a few negatives. Mash, Jermaine Blackwood, someone who he was dropped on the West Indies side a few years ago for his sort of temperament and inability to play the match situation. We we'd seen a mature Blackwood in the past few years, particularly 2020. He seems to have regressed, Mash. What are you saying? I mean, before George comes in, you you know it's you know it's serious, Santoki. When as a Jamaican, I'm struggling to, <laughs> to find a way. I'm struggling to find a way to to support Jermaine here. Listen, I I actually really like Jermaine Blackwood, and I think when it comes off, those counter attacking innings he can play are actually crucial when it comes off, and it helps put the pressure. He listen, Jermaine Jermaine plays on the the kind of psyche of. I'm going to put the pressure back on the bowlers. And when it comes off, it works. It worked in England in 2020 when he was our, our, our man of the seat. Well, he was our best batsman in England. And then obviously in New Zealand, he was our best batter as well. That shot, though, in the second innings was ridiculous. It was actually... Uh, uh, I'm hoping, Santolki, that he's not lost his confidence. But if I'm going to be honest, if he got dropped for Barbados... I wouldn't be surprised. I don't expect him to. I think he's going to get one more goal to, to come good again in Barbados. But if he if he got dropped, he'd only have himself to blame because remember, everybody everybody looks at Jermaine Blackwood as that player. And I, I said something yesterday to someone else that the problem with someone, when you play like Jermaine Blackwood, you better score runs because the way he gets out makes people forget everything else that he's done. So he, he can't, he doesn't have that long a rope because of the way he plays his game. George, as I guess as a neutral opinion, what's your views on uh, Mr. Blackwood? I, well, look, there's, there's, um, well, he's been made by a captain, hasn't he, which I found interesting. There's definitely room for someone like that. And maybe he was produced by the target. You know, m maybe it was a good target. Uh, he, it would have been a slightly odd time to go after the target. May have lost you for a second. No, you're there, you're there, you're good. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, it may have been um, that he was seduced by the target. It was a slightly odd time to be played aggressively because we'd obviously just lost three other wickets. Um, but uh, I'll cut him some slack there. And, and maybe he can play like that, which is clearly the way he's best playing, because he's got Bonner there mm. and it allows the other people to place their strength so you know he's had a poor game he will have four games uh i don't think they'll i, I don't think you can hold that against him too much at this stage because he is that sort of player and it, it's about making a team isn't it uh you you're not going to win many games if you've got six bonners but if you've got you know him and bonner backing together for two hours then you're going places so you know let's not overreact 
yeah, I, 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 I think that's pretty. Uh, I would, yeah, like I say, I would be surprised if if they kind of go with the overreaction drop. If he doesn't produce in Barbados, yes, I think he he won't go. He won't play at Grenada in Grenada. But um, I don't think any major decisions need to be made. But Santoki, I'll tell you where a major decision might need to be made <laughs> with I know with, your, country, <laughs> with your countryman, but Sammy Permo, because Santoki, Jack Leach had a really good game. Permo looked like. I was surprised, you know, Santoki. I'm not even. I'm not even criticizing. I was just surprised. Pomol, Pomol looked like he was on Test debut and was shorn of all confidence, which is a major surprise to me because he's the quote unquote top spinner in the Caribbean. Were, were you shocked by his performance? Yeah, very, very disappointed. Coming off the back of Sri Lanka, you'd you'd have thought he'd be confident. If you compare it to Jack Leach, Jack Leach bowled about what seventy odd overs. Pomol ended up bowling twenty five overs. He went wicketless. In the second innings, he was going at an economy over five. So knowing West Indies' complicated relationship with spinners, it would not surprise me if Pomor was either replaced with a Warwickon or Cornwall in the second test, or if they just didn't play an out-and-out spinner, specialist spinner. I think they could very well go based on that performance. And the fact they've never really displayed confidence in him to give him a consistent run, that, that might be the end for him in terms of this series, which would be a massive disappointment, knowing his potential. But as you say, Mash, he played... Someone who lost all his confidence in between the last test against the Sri Lanka. <laughs> the Barbie <laughs> Army's in the background. <laughs> they invaded, the, invaded the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but but, um, but um, before George uh, gives us a Barbie Army rendition of sorts, but um, yeah, the other thing I would just well, unfortunately, ladies and gents, uh, this is this is part two of the episode because um, you may remember that as we were recording. Um, George was hijacked by the Barmy Army. Well, he he's gone off to sing some songs with them, and uh, we're going to <laughs> we're going to wrap up we're going to wrap up the rest of this episode by just um, finishing off and kind of looking at the West Indies and give us, I guess, some overall predictions going into the second test. So, Santoki, we were um, we were chatting about uh, the Sammy Permol. Uh, mm. I guess let me put the question to you, Santoki. Do you think? Per mole is going to hold a drop for this second test. I've got a funny feeling he will. You know, I don't like to drop players after one test. Like for instance, I wouldn't drop Shamar Books um, from that just because you need you need a run of games to kind of show some consistency. But I just said, as I said before, um, I just feel West Indies' own relationship and lack of confidence in spinners, um, which is a historical issue, is, is essentially means Per Mole's probably in that side. As you said, Jermaine Blackwood, you'd still be surprised if he was dropped. So Pomol is looking like if there was to be a change, he'd be the most likely to get dropped. I don't know what you think about that, Mash. Yeah, so I'm. Uh, I don't think I. I think they should go unchanged personally into the yeah. second test. I think you just have to. I think you you have to give for Sammy another game. You have to give Brooks another game. And of all the players, Blackwood's on the thinnest ice. But I think you give him another game. Mm. However, like you say, Santoki, it wouldn't surprise me. But. Mm. I guess the only question mark for me is if Permol got dropped, what are they dropping him for? If it's another spinner, I think you have to go to Warrican. Yeah. If if it's another spinner, but it could quite easily be, and like Mayers could come back in for all I know. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be very very interesting to see which way the West Indies um, go from here. But I guess if we kind of just look at the second test, then Santel can almost wrap up from where we started at the top. You said at the top of the show, it's it's a stalemate right now. We would expect Barbados to have surely a bit more zip, a bit more pace in the wiki. Barbados doesn't naturally play low and slow. So if it's got a bit more zip and pace, who do you think has the advantage going into that scenario? Well, if it's if it's got the zip and pace, you're looking at who has a stronger bowling lineup, and I would say obviously with Mark Wood being ruled out, it's it's West Indies. I think Jaden Seals and Kamar Roach Roach knows that ground like the back of his hand, Kensington Oval. I think if it has got the zip and pace, which we expect from the Kensington Oval, then that will play right into Seals and Roach's hand, and it would give West Indies a slight advantage. We always seem to perform better at the Kensington Oval. That could be down to the Bayesian contingent we have in the side. We still got Braff, Weight, Holder, Brooks who again will be very, very confident and familiar on the ground. So I would have, I know we ended the last test sort of on the ropes at risk of losing it towards the end there, but I would still have us a slight advantage um, heading into the second test match. 
Yeah, I think if you throw in the holder factor as well with the bowling attack, um, I, I I think bowling wise we'd have the advantage. Batting wise, I still think England have got a better batting attack, uh, better sorry, better batting lineup than we have. So it's a really weird. No, it's a really interesting dichotomy to look at in terms of we've got the better bowlers, they've got the better bats, batters. Hmm. So it's hard to call it. Um, what I suspect will happen in this second test is that both sides at some point are going to be something like 70 for four. Yeah. Or, 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 or at some point across both innings or one of the innings or whatever it might be. So as ever, I guess, it's all about who bats first and... Oh, sorry, it's all about in that first innings who gets off to a better start. Because as much as we were on the ropes uh, for a bit in that second innings, basically our first innings made sure we couldn't lose a test match. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be very key to see which side has the better um, first innings in Barbados. And I suspect that will give go some way uh, to indicating who might who might win the second test. But mm -hmm. Santoki, I'll leave you with. Um, the final thoughts is such a quick turnaround that there's not a whole lot we can really jump into. So I'll leave you with the final thought. Rapid. Obviously, this was the three test series. It was meant to be two tests. So essentially, they've had to cram it in the time specs as you would have time frame as you would have for a two test series. So, yeah, rapid turnaround. I would be stunned if this test went to five days. Um, I think obviously Antigua, we've talked about the pitch essentially creating a five day test. I think both sides batting lineups. If the pitch does have a bit of zip and bounce, we're not going to see a five-day test. I could see it ending in three days. But it'll be chaos. Both sides have been known for that in recent years. So it'll definitely be one to watch out for. And yeah, as I said, I, I put West Indies are still having a slight advantage. So it wouldn't shock me if we came out of a win uh, from that second test match. Most definitely. And whatever it is, it's going to be an intriguing watch once again. Um, let's we Obviously, we're going to rally around the West Indies. But of course, for those who are watching England and our England supporters, we know that you too, will be rallying around your side. But either way, lock in. This has been the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. This has been episode 60 in partnership with The Cricketer. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rule Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket. By the fans, for the fans.